posts. Oh, I just got the recording. Should I start over, Kim, or? or uh... um, you can start from wherever you want. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, okay, I'm, I'm Michael Hawk, and uh, I'm based in San Jose. I'll hand over to Marav here in a moment, and she'll introduce herself and kick off the presentation. Um, I had the good fortune of meeting Kim through one of the informal Lorquin um, uh, bug chats that she hosts, which uh, which has been great. I've really enjoyed, and I uh, I think I showed a few golf pictures uh -huh. in one of those, and uh, and somebody had the idea of oh that might make a good presentation. So <laughs> here we are tonight uh, to talk about that. Uh, so as Kim said, um, I. Uh, well, as, as Kim started to say, I actually am not an entomologist. I'm not a uh, academic expert in plant galls. I'm just an enthusiast, but I've really fallen in love with them. I think they're super fascinating uh, from a photography standpoint and from a biology standpoint. And I hope that some of that interest we can you know, rub off on uh, the group here tonight. Um, my background is actually in data engineering and product management. I worked at Google for uh, quite a while and decided I wanted to leave tech and focus on environmental conservation. So that's partly why uh, I'm here tonight. And in doing so, as Kim said, I started a podcast called Nature's Archive. And if you're interested in learning more about galls, there are actually three or four different episodes where we dive very deeply into the subject and the biology and how to find them and you know beyond what we're doing here tonight. So there's a link that will show towards the end about that. Um, and uh, my own personal endeavors, I wanna do the, the most I can to connect people to nature and to save our environment. So I started a new conservation organization called Jumpstart Nature. It's still in its very early stages, uh, getting it off the ground, getting it up and functional. Um, but uh, we have interesting things that bring tech to nature and hopefully can convert more people to support the environment going forward. Uh, so with that, I will hand over to Marav and uh, let her get started. Thanks, Michael. Um, okay, so hi, everyone, and thanks for the invitation. Um, I've been to a few Lurkin, um meetings. Uh, I remember one about the new Beetle book that was really interesting, uh, probably a couple of others. And I also live here in San Jose. And I met Michael on some of the BioBlitz events that I organized. Uh, so I'm an entomologist. I studied ants for my PhD and postdoc. Uh, and before that, I studied other insects. Uh, but I am very excited about ants and many other insects and spiders and things. Oh. Uh, and I got very interested in galls a few years ago when I started organizing BioBlitz events in the summer and when it's very difficult to find uh, insects but the galls are right there and they don't move when you try to photograph them they just stay there uh they're colorful and pretty and most people are not aware of their existence uh, so i love introducing them to people uh, i've been organizing these events for six years now and i've been doing different projects in community science for over 10 years i manage um, a roadkill project of studying newts for example uh, so I do many different things, but I really enjoy talking about these weird creatures with people. Um, and we'll have a BioBlitz uh, this Sunday where hopefully we'll be able to show people plenty of awesome goals. But in SoCal, you have so many other awesome species that maybe you could tell us about when we have the Q&A at the end. So let's uh, start a presentation. Okay, let me know if you can see my slideshow and it looks good. It's working well. Okay, good. That's great. So let's get started. Um, so I don't know how many of you, obviously, most people here are entomologists. So probably you have some knowledge about plant goals. Um, so for today, we will talk about what are goals? Um, how are they formed? which organisms induce them, and what would be the best ways to find them? Uh, and when you find something, how could you decide if that's a goal or not a goal? Uh, some tips about documenting them on iNaturalist, both Michael and I are very active on iNaturalist and enjoy documenting them, especially during Go Week, which is something we made up a couple of years ago, and we'll tell you all about that. 
uh, at the end of the presentation. Okay, so first, if you haven't seen or uh, noticed goals before, um, you probably noticed these big apples that you sometimes see on oaks. Here it's mostly on valley oak, but sometimes on other oak species. Uh, these are pretty large things that, you know, most people notice if they look at trees. Uh, but most people say, oh, these are just um, oak apples, which obviously oaks don't really grow apples. They grow acorns. Those are the seeds. Uh, and other weird structures would be something external um, that could be induced by an insect or another organism, uh, like this one. This is a specific species of wasp that induces this species of uh, this kind of gall, uh, usually on valley oak, but on a few closely related species as well. But it's not the only one. So in addition to this one, if you look closely, you might find a whole range of beautiful, weird little shapes, different colors, different things uh, that you could find on many oak species, but also on other kinds of plants. So let's learn more about them. Um, so how are they formed? Uh, Gulls are structured growth uh, of plant tissue, and they're produced uh, by the plant host in response to me mechanical or chemical stimulation. Uh, they're induced by the adult or the larva of insects or mites or fungi. And I might say uh, for the rest of the presentation, just insect, but it could be these other creatures and that we will mention uh, as well. Um, the mechanism varies according to the plant and the gall inducer. Uh, galls are formed on different parts of the plant, on leaves, stems, petioles, branches, buds, flowers, seeds, roots, and even the fruit. And they're so pretty and cute. Um, common type of galls. So these are two different uh, stem galls. Uh, one is detachable. The other one is integral. Uh, there are different kinds of leaf galls. There are many different kinds. This is a leaf roll on the left and a leaf fold on the right. We also have pouch gall, beet gall, erinium gall. It's just there's such a huge diversity, it makes it easier to describe them once we name them. Um, I like showing this slide because it shows you the most common plant or the plant that has the highest number of gall inducers. So on oaks in California or in the Western US, you could find the highest number of gall species, um, which is incredible. Uh, and then the next plant would be willows, and then cottonwood, crescent bush, rabbit brush, sagebrush, coyote brush, and the list goes on. And this is all using this incredible book by Russo from 2021. And uh, there used to be the old book that was out of print, so we're very happy when uh, this one came out a couple of years ago. Um, so this list is for the Western states. It's pretty accurate for the Bay Area, but also for uh, Southern California. So I was looking at this um, subset of data uh, on iNaturalist, and it seems like the top plants on this list are actually the top host plants um, in Southern California as well, uh, with the oaks at first, and then uh, all the top plants here uh, up to Coyote Brush are also the top plants in Southern California. But of course, the species of galls might be slightly different. Um, it's important to note that gall inducers are species specific. So usually a wasp species, for example, uh, a specific wasp species would only be able to induce its galls on one uh, species of host plant or on closely related host plants. Some species have a wider uh, um, use of plants, but most of them are pretty restricted. Um, so when we look at different uh, oak galls, for example, uh, we can see that, well, there are many different shapes and colors and all that stuff. But if we look at the host plant, then it gets really interesting. So the ones marked in red are found on coast live oak. The ones marked in blue are found on valley oak. In green, uh, blue oak, 
to make it confusing. Uh, and then this is the scrub oak and canyon live oak. But if we think about it, these oaks belong to different groups. So uh, a coast live oak is a black oak. Um, valley blue and scrub oak are all white oaks. And the, interme the intermediate oaks include canyon live oak and others. Uh, to me as an entomologist, this didn't make any sense at first. But when I started looking at the calls, I was able to understand the oaks finally, because it's pretty easy usually to identify galls to species level, unless something went wrong, and I'll explain what that could be later. Um, but it's pretty easy to identify them. Uh, they have these really unique shapes, and um, they're somewhat easy to identify, at least the, the common ones. But then if you know the gall, you could identify the host, okay? Or if you know the host, it would make it easier for you to identify the gall. Uh, and, and that's really useful. But also if you want to learn the oak uh, groups, then that's pretty cool because uh, white oaks, for example, uh, are more likely to share gall species. So valley oak and blue oak, for example, share many of the gall species, not all of them, but many of them. Um, so for me, that was a really good way to learn the plants. For botanists, maybe that would be a good way to learn some insects. Um, when we look at the gall-inducing organisms, we can look at different uh, groups of organisms. So first, fungi, that three different families. Mites, uh, which you probably know are tiny arachnids um, related to ticks. And then aphids, moths. Uh, gall midges, soulflies, gall wasps, beetles, and fruit flies. So beetles and fruit flies, for example, is just a few species or some species that can induce galls. When we look at gall midges and gall wasps, it's the entire family that has some association with galls. Uh, and now I'd like to talk about the different groups. So we'll start with the mites, uh, which are obviously tiny uh, arachnids, but uh, the ones that induce uh, galls are even smaller. So in order to see them, you actually need a microscope. Um, and this one, I dissected a coast live oak erinium mite, which is a mite called this one. And I was able to find a few mites inside that are very elongated. They have fewer legs, which I think is fascinating. Um, and they're found in a little pouch on the underside of the leaf. In general, you can see that uh, the galls are pretty similar, there are little bumps on the leaf. Uh, often they'll have brown hairs on the underside and uh, they're slightly less specific about their host species. So the one on oaks, you can find on quite a few different oak species. And this is the least known uh, group. So there's plenty to learn here. Maybe only 10% of the species is actually known. If you are looking to describe new species, this might be your group. Okay, uh, the next group is aphids. So some aphids, most of them are free living, but some of them induce galls. Um, some of them have very complex life cycles with one generation in a gall, another generation in the roots or somewhere else on a plant or on a different plant. Very, very interesting. Um, I like to give this gall as an example. It's found on... Um, Fremont cottonwood, it's pretty common, but though sometimes uh, you need to look very high up on the tree to find them. Uh, this is an interesting gall because at some point a little slit will open in the gall, like you see here in the picture on the left, uh, which will allow some aphids to go out, but also it allows ants to come in and tend those um, aphids inside. This is the Argentine ant, which is a non-native here, but still loves aphids. Uh, and this is a gall that we opened, uh, and you could see tons of little aphids inside. So this is one example. Uh, the next group is the moths. So there are three different families that have species that can induce galls in them. Um, the most common one, I think, at least here, is the one we see on coyote brush. Um, it's induced by the larva and not by the female or by laying its eggs. Uh, the pretty simple galls, either like this one, or often it will be like a leaf fold or something like, I think this kind of looks like a candy to me, where the caterpillar is in, in the middle. 
Um, our next group is the gold midges, which is a much more diverse group. There are thousands of species worldwide and over 100, uh, 1,100 species in North America alone. Um, some of these species have individual larval chambers and other are gregarious, which means that you could have more than one larva per gall. Um, the galls here develop after the larva starts feeding. I'll explain why this Inf this information is important in a couple of slides. Uh, some of the species uh, induce galls, other, other species are inquilines or even predators, so have a different way to use galls, which I'll also explain later. But you can see that they look pretty different. So uh, many species on willows, many, many, many species on cressart bush, uh, which is common uh, in the desert, in the Mojave Desert. Uh, this is the large one that you could see, but there are lots of smaller species, and then another species on coyote brush. Um, but yeah, pretty different from one another. The next group is the sawflies, uh, which are uh, somewhat primitive wasps. Uh, here the gall formation begins with the egg laying, and I'd like to explain now why that is important. So this means that once the female wasp lays its egg, it will start the formation of the gall. If something happens to that larva, if it dies at some point, if even if the egg dies, it doesn't matter the gall would form. So if you open this gall, sometimes you'll find nothing in there because something happened to the larva. Uh, in other groups, it might be different. Um, okay. Uh, usually there's only one generation per year, but for this species, it's just very common, the willow opal gall, uh, there could be up to six different generations per year. Okay, our next group is the gall wasps, cinepids, uh, which are amazing, I think. This is all that diversity they showed you in the beginning and, and here in this slide. Over 800 species in North America. Most of them develop on oaks, but some on plants from the rose family, like rose. Um, the Galls here are induced by the developing lava, which means that the gall won't develop if the egg dies. Uh, and if something happens to the lava, it might look slightly off, okay? Because the lava is the one that affecting how the gall would look like. Uh, the galls are complex with multiple layers of tissues, and they always have an internal chamber and they can have either one or up to many different chambers inside the gall, so depending on the species. And uh, again, these characteristics are important because if you find a gall that you've never seen before, or maybe that nobody's seen before, uh, if you open it, usually I don't open them because I kind of feel bad you destroy them, but sometimes it's really interesting or important or you want to show it to people. So sometimes, you know, I'd open one and show people because a larva of a centipede wasp would look different than a gall midge than, you know, the other gall juices. And also the, the shape of the gall would look different depending on the gall inducer. Um, it's important to note that only 75% of the species are known here in the Bay Area. I think in Southern California, it's probably even lower. So there's still so much to discover here. And every time we, we go out, we find, you know, we often find species that we know of that are undescribed species. So there's some common species that are undescribed. Uh, but then sometimes we find one that's like, oh, this is new. And we, we do some research and, you know, we contact experts and stuff and it's like, no, this is actually a new species. So it's just about going out and looking at them and documenting them and uh, getting the right contacts with researchers. Um, yeah, it's, it's very exciting. Okay. And it's not that easy because uh, some of these species have alternate generations, uh, which means that they have two separate generations in the fall which is now, starts in the summer. Um, there's the fall generation that has to survive the winter. And it's usually a unisexual generation with only females inside. Uh, 
once they hatch in the spring from their ball, uh, we'll have the spring generation, which has very good growth conditions, uh, the tons of nutrients in the plants, they grow quickly, develop quickly, and finish their entire cy cycle pretty fast. This generation is bisexual or sexual generation, usually with males and females inside. So once they get out, they have to meet each other, mate, and lay new eggs that will create the uh, summer or fall generation. Al alternate generation, uh, the goals could look different and even the female wasps could look different. So this might explain why we still don't know so much because some of these species were, or some of these alternate generations were described as two different species, even though it's the same wasp because you have to collect the goals, you have to rear them, you have to describe these species and then sometimes like, oh, we already have that species described. So, and but by the way, even for the most common goal or the most, obvious goal, the big apples that I showed you in the, my first slide, even those are not fully understood because we only know of a female generation for that species, which I think is fascinating. Um, these goals, these alternate generations could even be on different parts of the plant, like this example. So this is the live oak apple gall on a coast live oak. Um, and let's start, I uh, just want to show you the life cycle again to make it uh, more clear. Uh, let's start with the summer or fall generation. These are the goals that you might see pretty soon. I think maybe not now, but very soon. Other species are already out there, at least in this area. Um, so these goals include um, females only because at the end of the winter, maybe they won't be able to find each other. It's a really good strategy that they don't need to find a male. They just reproduce autogenetically. Um, they lay eggs on often a different part of the plant. This is a bud gall, a stem bud gall. This one is a leaf gall. So they uh, lay their eggs on the leaves. Uh, and inside, there'll be a bisexual uh, generation with males and females that will emerge between uh, May and June. Um, and then meet, mate, and lay their eggs. Okay. But the gall inducing wasp is not alone. There could be some unintended guests. Uh, predators. So different birds like to feed on the creatures inside the galls, like some woodpeckers that would peck on them and get the tiny wasp from the inside. Um, and then they might have some guests inside the galls, uh, such as inquilines, which are uninvited guests, uh, like a roommate that you didn't really invite in, but you know somehow found their way into your gall. So this is the gall inducer. This is the wasp, the lava that actually is inducing the gall formation. This is a different species. This is another lava of an inquilin species. So usually a closely related species that can use the same gall. It's mostly herbivore, so it doesn't eat the host lava, but it would sometimes kill it. Uh, it's it's mostly interested in the gall itself. But remember, because the lava is the one inducing the gall and creating it, having this little roommate there might be changing the way the gall would form. Okay. In addition to that, we might have parasites. So these are wasps from other families that uh, are there to eat to consume the lava of uh, the original uh, wasp, the cinepid wasp. Um, they will lay their eggs directly on the host lava and it will consume them. And again, because the lava um, of the host is supposed to create this beautiful shape, it might be a bit messed up. So this could be because there was a parasite in there uh, or an inquilin or maybe something else happened to the lava. Same here. This is the normal shape that we usually see. This is something else. Pretty creative. Um, but it's really interesting to go out after the beginning of the gall season to go and look for galls, look very closely because these wasps sometimes are so persistent that they would stay there, they would, you know, circle their girls and, and try to find a way to lay their eggs. Look at the ovipositor of this one. Um, and it's really interesting to watch them and try and document them. 
Um, they have some defense mechanisms. So one is secreting honeydew. So some uh, gulls would actually make the plant, not only create a little shelter for them, provide all their foods and all their needs, but also secrete some honeydew, because why not? Um, so they'll secrete some honeydew, uh, which is basically sugar water or plant sap that is very attractive to ants, like these Argentine ants here, but also to yellow jackets and other wasps. And that constant movement around the gulls probably reduces um, the ability of parasitic wasps to, or inquilins to find these gulls and lay their eggs in there. It's pretty amazing. Um, so just a couple of words about Southern California gulls. Uh, I looked at that subset of data and again, these are the same species we saw in the previous table uh, that are the most common ones, just slightly differently ordered, right? Oak, sagebrush, crescent bush, rabbit brush, willow, cottonwood, coyote brush. These are the top host plants. There are many others. Um, but if you're new to gulls or if you want to see more, it's often great to just find these super hosts, you know, like the host plants that can have many different species. I mean, look at that, 80 species. That's incredible. Um, just according to iNaturalist. Um, yeah. So if you find any of these plants, you're pretty, you're more likely to find some galls on them. And these are some of the species of the oaks, for example. So Canyon Live Oak, which is also a great host plant here. Coast Live Oak, Scrub Oak. And the list goes on. Okay, and now I'll stop sharing my screen so Michael can take over. Thank you, Marav. And before I pull my screen up, just uh, if I mean, my mind just seeing this and thinking about this, it always gets blown again and again. Thinking about what we're talking about is basically nature's oldest genetic engineers when you think about it, because these insects and the fungi I'm going to talk about here in a moment have figured out how to manipulate the genetic expression of these plants for the purposes of their life cycle. And if that doesn't blow your mind, you know, I don't know, I don't know what would. Um, so in fact, uh, if, if you're familiar with Charlie Iceman, um, he's, he's a well-known entomologist and, or ecologist and entomologist wrote a book about uh, tracks and sign of insects. And he likes to call galls, um, a truce in the evolutionary arms race it's it's a situation where the plants and the insects have figured out a way to allow both to coexist in a way uh, which is kind of cool to think about it that way as well which i know it's anthropomorphizing a little bit so let me get my screen up and going here and um if i can get a confirmation that the slide is visible yeah, I see a thumbs up. So as, as cool as these wasps and insects are, I'm going to take a step back for just a moment and talk about fungal galls, uh, because you will encounter those if you start looking for galls. And what's interesting to me about, about this is that there's actually fossil evidence of fungi-induced galls from over 200 million years ago, and that's well before any insect galls show up in the fossil record. So as is often the case, fungi seem to have figured out this strategy first. And as mentioned earlier, there's three different families of fungi inducers, and there's some examples shown here. Uh, the first is an exobasidium fungi named because the exo is you know, external, and that's where the spores are produced on the, uh, on the surface of the plant, like um, is shown in the lower left. Um, then there's rust fungi, uh, which is the coyote brush rust as an example, and sac fungi, which is these leaf curl galls. And there are actually other types of gall-like structures that fungi produce, like witch's broom and things like that. There's some gray areas here. So technically, maybe it's th more than three families at this point, but that's up for a debate. So let's just take a little closer look at coyote brush rust. And despite its name, uh, I, I want to point out that this can actually occur on other Baccarat species as well, though coyote brush is where I see it most often. And I think it's pretty amazing to look at. So you see the swelling here on the stem, and it's almost like the fungi is bursting out from the inside of the stem. And that begs the question, how? So gall-inducing fungi 
have similar biology to other parasitic fungi. They need spores to reproduce. They need proper conditions to germinate in the first place. And then they sprout tiny thread like hyphae that grow into mycelia. And you can see here again, there's this characteristic swelling and you see spores erupting from the inside. But how do the fungi gain such an integral foothold within this plant? You know, unlike insects, it's not like they're waiting for just the right time to lay their egg or inject their egg uh, to, um, to cause this. So what I always like to say is never underestimate the power of mycelia. Uh, they can be quite strong and can actually penetrate the host, even healthy ones. Now there is some documentation that wounded plants or wounds on plants are more susceptible, but like everything, there's some variability in there. So I'm not going to linger too much longer on fungal galls. I just wanted to give this as some context. And, and here's one more interesting one that I think might be applicable to Southern California as well. And it's another example also of, of all the discoveries waiting to be made with galls. So I found this gall uh, at a little park out um, in a remote area here in the Bay Area on a toyon leaf. And I know you have plenty of toyon in your area. And um, you know, this one here, it was about between one and two centimeters wide. And it's believed to be a gymnosporangium fungi. It's one of those rust fungi. And I, I love how it looks because you see these little tubes just kind of extruding out of the gall, almost like a Play-Doh fun factory where, you know, you, you push down on the, on the lever and the Play-Doh kind of comes out and, and these are spore tubes. So this is part of its reproductive cycle. And um, this genus had never been documented on Toyon before. And I just stumbled across it one day and, um, and since then I look for more and I found it on another specimen. So, uh, I would love to find out that there's more of these in existence, but for right now, we only know it in one little Canyon here in the Bay area. So let's talk a little bit more about finding galls. We've shown these close up photos of colorful galls, and they're not always that easy to find though. They can be. So let's get into this a little bit more. I could just glibly say, look closely and you'll find galls. And I, I purposely included pictures with my fingers in here. So you can see how small some of these galls are. Some of them are quite large. Some of them are quite small. So for me to find galls, you know, the first thing is you kind of have to shift your attentional filter. If you're looking for movement, obviously you're not going to see many galls, uh, but if you're looking for kind of abnormal growths, different colors, uh, if you're changing your focus from the underside of leaves to stems to petioles to um, the fruit or acorns or whatever the case and and scan the plant in different ways you're going to be more likely to find some of these and from you know technique aside the general case aside you know as we've been talking about start with the plants and if the point wasn't clear enough if you know your plant and you can describe the morphology of the gall, you can very often get to family or genus or maybe even species. So we very often start with the plants and a really good approach um, is to use that book that Marav held up earlier. And we have a link later. It's uh, it's uh, the book by Russo from 2021. Uh, it's a field guide to Western galls. And there's also a great website, by the way, called Gallformers. I think it's gallformers.org, but we do have that link again towards the end. And you can search by host plant and get uh, a summary of the different galls on a given host plant. So whoop, I uh, went one slide too much. These, these four galls shown here are all found on coyote brush. And very often when I encounter any of these hosts that we've been talking about, Canyon Live Oak or Coyote Brush or Creosote, I'm going to scan that plant looking specifically for abnormal things such as this. So again, here's our list. Recall our list. Now we often focus on these top gall plants. These are the plants that insects have uh, been able to co-evolve with best to create galls. But some of the most common galls are not from this list. And the one on the right, you've very likely seen if you've ever looked closely at a manzanita and it's made by the manzanita leaf gall aphid creatively named. And it shows up as a swelling often on the leaf margin as the picture shows. So don't ignore other plants that you see as well. And you'll kind of start to 
get used to the common galls that you see in your area. And here's another good example that didn't come from that list. It's ethereal spear. And I, I admit, I didn't look to see if you get ethereal spear down in SoCal. I think you do, but I didn't verify that. But this thickening of the stem uh, is a midge gall, and they can sometimes be so common that virtually every specimen in a patch will have this gall. Uh, so if you didn't know any better, you think, oh, this is just how the plant grows, uh, but, uh, but it's actually a gall. So galls can be found all year, but the best time, as Marav said, is really spring and then late summer or fall. And the reason for that is that's when there are different growth spurts in the plants. So these inducers have to rely on the plant putting energy into growth and then you know they induce the growth. So um, this, uh, as an example, here in the Bay Area, down in your area, you can find a lot of galls in the middle of winter in December and January. And in fact, certain types of galls, the more cryptic ones might be easier to find at that point. Uh, when a plant has lost its leaves, for example, those stem galls or maybe some of the um you know rosette galls that stick around even when the leaves are dropped will suddenly become apparent because they're just going to stand out like a sore thumb and newly fallen leaves can often present an opportunity to take a look at a leaf that you might not ordinarily have access to because it's just simply too high up in the tree so uh, i know a lot of the galls we find on blue oaks around here are uh, from leaves that have fallen in the fall now this data I show here, it comes from iNaturalist. It comes from the Galls of North America project. And you can kind of see those trends. It's not a perfect data set though, because there are lots of reasons why people might choose to report or not report galls. And for example, these two big peaks here in 2022 and 2021, that came from Gall Week that we both alluded to already a couple of times. So that's a focused effort to get people out and taking photographs of galls around the world and then reporting them. And as a result, we saw that we were able to really drive up the number of reports across the globe, which is pretty cool. And we'll talk more about that. So there are so many undiscovered and undescribed galls out there that it is always worth looking at the plant through those different lenses that I've talked about, scanning the leaves and the twigs and the fruits and the flowers. And over time, I like to call it cognitive flexibility. You're going to just start to notice things that don't belong, maybe abnormal things. So let's dig a little bit deeper into this. And here, by the way, it's a preview of some of those fascinating oak galls. Uh, this comes from a, a brochure that Marav has on her website. Uh, Bioblitz.club is the website. And uh, she's created a couple interesting little pamphlets that you can print out and hand out to people if you're leading walks or things like that, that uh, can be very helpful to uh, identify what, what you're looking at. So you're going to inevitably encounter abnormal things. Like I said, that cognitive flexibility and wonder, is this a gall or not? And it may not always be clear. So there are several attributes you can check and take note of to help you figure this out. Uh, some of these we discussed earlier, such as the placement on the plant, uh, what type of plant, et cetera. But we're going to go through a couple examples here in a moment that I hope will uh, will be fun for everybody to walk through. So some things to consider first, where is it growing on the plant? Top of the leaf, bottom of the leaf, midrib, uh, fruit, etc. Is it attached to the plant? Uh, is it integral? Most galls are going to be attached in some way, though some might be very brittle. Some fall off very easily as part of their reproductive cycle. They, they um, need to fall off into a leaf litter, for example. Um, but there would still be some evidence of a point of origin of growth, even if it falls off. And th how does it look compared to other growths? So this is pretty self-explanatory, but sometimes, you know, you might see something that stands out and you don't see any other examples of it. That may not tell you for sure if it's a gall or not, but it's another data point to consider as you're going through this, this exploratory phase. Um, so it's not uncommon also for a plant to have many, many instances of a given gall. So you can see it all over the place on one plant. You can see dozens or hundreds of a certain type of gall. And then try to compare it to other structures on the same plant or on a neighboring plant, um, which again, is not gonna tell you for sure if it's a gall or not. I think, uh, Marav and I have both encountered cases where there's 
two trees right next to each other and one is covered in galls and the neighboring one doesn't have any galls at all. Uh, so uh, again, just another data point to figure things out. And then can you see an exit hole on it? Remember there's larva inside, at least if it's not, not a fungi gall, but if it's one of these insects and at some point they're gonna come out. Maybe they haven't come out yet, but maybe they already have, but the exit hole is a pretty clear indication that there was something inside. And then if you do decide to take it, you can dissect it. Does it have a chamber? Uh, you know, some of the other things that we talked about. So what do you think about this one? I do see, I haven't been able to read the chat messages. I think we're gonna handle most questions later, but I wanna ask you all, and Kim, do, do people, can, can people jump in and, and answer, uh, unmute and answer? Sure, you can unmute, anyone can unmute yourself and uh, jump in. So the question in here is, is this a gall, yes or no? And the hint I'll give you is it's on a coast live oak. And that's all right. If uh, if nobody wants to to take a wager, um, it's actually not a gall. So despite the placement, the placement looks a little bit like it could be a gall. Uh, it wasn't attached. Now, of course, you can't tell that from the picture. So um, when I touched it, it, it fell off. It was also really moist. So as Marav said earlier, most galls do not secrete honeydew, though a few do. The fact it was moist was a little bit suspect because that's that would be uncommon. And there were no other instances of this on the plant. And it was very likely part of a berry that probably fell off from a tree that was nearby. So uh, I, I got all excited, like, oh, maybe this is a new gall, but it turned out it, it's uh, just a berry. So here's another one. Uh, the question again is gall or not a gall? It's a twisted leaf. When, when I touched it, I kind of squeezed it. It felt pretty hard and the host plant is listed here. So any, any guesses as to if this is a gall or not? Am I gonna have to I'll, call I'll, on someone? I'll, okay. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll ask a question. Okay. Is it the whole structure that you're calling the gall or is it that one little uh, dot? Oh, that's a good question. That one, it's not the one little dot. It's the whole structure here that, that I'm asking about. That one little dot is something else. Um, maybe like a little, I don't know, thrip or I don't know, something. It looks like an aphid, I think. An aphid? Hmm. So if that's an aphid, I, I'll go ahead and I'll venture and say it's an aphid-induced gall. <laughs> <laughs> A wild guess. Well, you're partly right. <laughs> it is a gall. And um, this is one that we talked about briefly earlier. It's made by this uh, cosmet moth uh, that, that creates, it has a habit of creating these kind of twisted leaf galls. Now, this one here, as, uh, as entomologists, you may, you may be able to figure this one out a little more easily. It's a leaf fold on a coast live oak. Like if you look closely, there's some hints as to whether this is a gall or not. I'll guess it's a caterpillar that has larva in there because I see some like silk thread. That's, that's a good guess. Um, it's not a gall and you're right. This is a mechanical leaf fold. So the inducer, or here it's not, I shouldn't even say inducer, the, the, the um, organism that created this fold mechanically pulled the leaf over using some silk. And it actually was a spider. Uh, at least there was a spider inside. Whether the spider was the one that used the silk, I don't know. But when I, when I peeked inside, a spider went running away. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, just a couple more of these that uh, I, I always enjoy, but, the, but here's another one that, again, I think you can figure out if the resolution here is good enough. Uh, when I touched it, it was actually hard. Um, so it was a solid, hard, this white thing here in the middle. So gall or not a gall? We're all friends, everybody jump in. <laughs> I picked some hard ones here, I admit, so. <laughs> it almost looked like a spittle bug until you said it was hard. Well, that, that was a purposely 
deceiving hint. <laughs> so it, it's not a gall, you're right. It is from a spittle bug and it apparently desiccated. It just dried out so rapidly that the form stayed, but it was solid, it was solidified. So you can actually see those little bubbles solidified in here, which is really weird. And it, it did throw me off at first. Uh, and uh, yeah, spittle bug is correct. So everybody's favorite invasive non-native tree in California, um, eucalyptus, one of the eucalyptus species. So this thing here, um, sometimes galls, when they get older, start to look a little harsh, a little ragged. Spider webs or fungi or other things can start to uh, make them look weird or obscure them. So this was on a eucalyptus and uh, it was very brittle, very thin, and it easily fell off when touched. And I'm thinking maybe somebody here knows the answer to this one. All right, no guesses. All right. So it's not a gall. It's um, along with these Australian plants, we brought along some Australian insects too. So this is a uh, red gum lerp psyllid. And this creates a somewhat of a protective cap through its own excretions. And that's what we're seeing here is the psyllid would be inside of this uh, at some stage and, and this little cap is uh, what it creates to protect itself or cover itself. So here's um, just a couple more. This is on an oak tree trunk and it's big. So feel free to jump in. I would say that's gotta be some kind of gall because it's grown into the tree. It is integrated in the tree. So this is something that is often confused for a gall. It's a burl. And you might be wondering, well, what's the difference? I've heard of a burl, and burls are these big, clumpy growths on trees. And uh, unlike galls, they, while they are these growths, they do not serve a reproductive purpose. So that's one distinguishing factor. And uh, so how does a burl form? Well, there's a lot not known about them. Some people think it could be an injury or stress or a fungal or bacterial infection. But again, it's not part of a reproductive process. So they're kind of in their own class, not galls. So I really like this one. You can't tell, but the plant is a canyon live oak. We pointed out it's one of the best plants for galls. And as you probably can tell by now, the hints I give um, sometimes purposely mislead. <laughs> so, uh, what, it, what about this one? You see this nice big ball here, definitely not, you know, something normal on a Canyon live Oak. All right. As you're thinking about that, it is one of my favorite insects but it's not a gall it's actually this really specialized scale insect which has a fascinating life history that i, I definitely want to learn more about um, but you can't even see its head it's like underneath um, and it looks so much like a gall the common name for this group is gall like scale insect and there's a number of them that we can find uh, so they're one of the favorite things that i encounter when i'm looking for galls all right this is the very last one I won't torture you with any more of these. Um, so here's a weird looking little structure that was found on a uh, California scrub oak. You can see it's growing out of a bud of some sort, but it doesn't look like a normal thing. It doesn't look like a leaf. It doesn't look like an acorn. It doesn't look like a catkin. That was a big hint. So it's growing out of a bud doesn't look quite right. It is a gall. It's actually, uh, this would have been an acorn. And uh, this is an undescribed species. So we see this occasionally. It's not like it's super rare, but it's one of these examples where the inducer has not been reared and described and matched up to, you know, a known taxa or a newly described taxa. So uh, more work needed. 
So that last example, I think, is, is an excellent reminder that there's a lot that's still not known. You have some really cool oaks down in your area, in particular, like the Engelman oak and the Muller oak and, and those scrub oaks that it's probably a lots of discoveries waiting to happen. And maybe you could even make a discovery in your own backyard. So this one here, this gull that I show here, it's a flower bud. And I found it in my own backyard on a California coffee berry, Frangula californica. And um, despite it being undescribed, it's fairly hard to find, but not super hard to find. And, you know, I, I wasn't quite sure what it was. I had a whole bunch of them. They show up every spring. Uh, in great numbers. So I decided to open one up and see what was going on. And sure enough, here's some larva of a midge. So, um, you know, right in my backyard, something that's undescribed species and not too, not found too often. And maybe even more interesting is later in the year, this fruit that would have formed in the coffee berry, I noticed it looked a little bit off and it had a hole in it. It's like, okay, well, that's unique. And uh, sure enough, uh, this is also a gall. It's a fruit gall on the same plant. And this was a never before documented species. Uh, but of course, once I posted it on iNaturalist, people started looking for it. There's a community of gall enthusiasts and, and people were able to find it in a few different places shortly thereafter. So we're hot on the trail of who induces this. Um, and here's an example of the iNaturalist discussion that ensued. So moving along, I know we're uh, maybe a bit over time, so I'll try to speed things up. Um, another example of discovering galls, uh, this spring I was out looking at a coast live oak and I saw that there were some American winter ants on a bud. And normally you don't see that. The ants usually don't care too much about regular old buds. So I was thinking, well, there must be something going on here. Maybe there's some honeydew being excreted. And I compared it to other buds. Sure enough, it looked a little bit different. You know, with my hand lens, I could see it looked different something was wrong and I opened one up and there was a wasp larva on the inside. And at the time, um, again, this is one that had rarely been reported, uh, a species called the Cocosynips attractans. And after reporting it and after getting some of the gall enthusiasts looking, more were found. And in fact, some previous documentation on iNaturalist was determined to be misidentified. So again, small steps to community science here. Uh, so just look, I guess that's the moral of the story. Just look when you see something that doesn't look right, maybe it's an interesting gall inducing insect. So with that, uh, I'm gonna hand it back over to Marav to uh, carry us through to the end. Sorry, unmute, yes. Thank you, Zoom, for teaching us how to do this. Um, okay, hopefully you can see my slides, okay? Yes? Okay, thank you. Uh, so we showed you all these amazing things. Hopefully the next thing you're going to do tomorrow morning is go out and look for gods. You already know where and how. What you do when you see them? So I highly recommend document them. Uh, I'm totally addicted to iNaturalists. I think Michael is on the right way to do so himself. Uh, and it's a great way both to, for yourself, you know, to document what you see, but also to share it with this huge community to contribute to this huge database uh, that is used for many different studies. Um, okay, so when you document calls, there are some important tips. First, always write down the whole species. Um, it's really important because that's key for identification. Uh, and it's really important. If you don't know the whole species, it's fine. Just document that as well. Um, you can add that to different gold projects, like Golds of California or Golds of North, North America. Um, you could add annotations. So if you're using iNaturalist, if you go to your observation on the website, you could add annotations like goals. You could add host plants, and those are really important when you want later to filter uh, data on iNaturalist. Like you remember you saw it called before, you can't remember the name, it happens to me all the time. And then I know that I saw it before on Coast Live Oak, so I'll sort all these observations on Coast Live Oak, and then I'll find my species. It's really useful. 
go week. So I mentioned that before. Uh, a few years ago, uh, I basically decided we need to have go week event, just like, you know, there's taco day and all these random, very random events. We need to have go week. So I said, okay, let's have one. Uh, and I just wrote a post on my uh, journal post in iNaturalist. And by the end of the day, there were people from like Southern California, from then from different states, from different places. We got like uh, 28 states, 15 countries. It was very exciting. Uh, since then, we already had three different events. And the fourth one is actually happening. So these are like 2021, 2022 in the fall. And then this year we had the spring event and now we'll have a fall event. Um, and it's between September 2nd and September 10th is when you go out and document things. You could upload it uh, later if you need to, um, but these are the dates. And this is a project we will share. Hopefully all these links with you later if we can. Uh, we already have 146 people signed up. Um, to do that, you will need to make your observations and then join the project and add the observations manually to the project. If you're not sure how to do that, you could go to my website, Bioblitz Club, and watch some videos about iNaturalist, about community science, about goals, all sorts of uh, fun things like that. Uh, or go to the project for this um, uh, for Goal Week, and there'll be some information there as well. And yeah, my website, Ballot Club, has some resources as well. I don't know how useful they would be in Southern California, but there's other things that these are flyers that I create, but there are lots of other things in there. Uh, some webinars from time to time, uh, mostly Bioblitz events, but also lots of uh, different videos that you could watch. And these are the important resources that we'd like to share with you. Um, Go Week, I Naturalist Project different books that we highly recommend, um, Gull Former's website, Nature Archives, uh, podcasts about gulls and Bible's Club. And a uh, special thank, thank you to Paul Heipel and Sarah Wheat that helped creating the uh, original presentation. And then these are our contacts. Um, so for Michael and for me, um, this is where you can find us. So maybe I'll leave that on for a second and if you have questions, we could do them now. Otherwise, I'll stop sharing in a minute. So yeah, let's stop sharing. It, I do have a question uh, to ask. Sure. Okay. Yes. Um, we are treating gulls as a species almost. You're labeling it as a species, but isn't it? It's a, like a byproduct of the the specific tree. It, I'm not calling it a fruit, but it's really coming out of a specific tree. So it's kind of tied to the tr to the tree. It's not a different species, or is it? It's the species of the gull inducer. So it's the species of the wasp, or the mite, or the fungus, or the organism inducing that. So yeah, something will... inducing it, but it's coming yeah. off of the plant itself, no? Or is it totally... No, like the structure you... is. So you, you're right about the part of the structure. The structure is integral part right. of the plant. It's created by the plant, it's plant tissue. But inside, there's some way of reproduction of the gall-inducing organism. So for example, if we are talking about gall wasps, inside the plant structure, you'll have a little lava. So the scientific name, you're right, is not for the structure, it's for the wasp. Okay. The structure is I understand. part of the Thank, plant. Thanks, thanks for it. Yeah, no, but that's that's a good uh, okay. comment. Thank so, you. so if you're talking about putting that on something like iNaturalist, what you can do in iNaturalist, for those who aren't familiar with it, is put um, the same image twice, one for the host plant and say, identify the host, and then you put it in, um, that you can identify the species of wasp or moth based on the evidence of the gall. So, so correct, yes and correct no, me I would, if I'm wrong. You're right, but I would recommend to 
maybe if you want to document the golf for the plant, like as a plant observation to get an overview photo. And I, yeah. I try to get that often, but because for example, the golf that Michael has in his background, you can uh -huh. find that on a few closely related species. Uh, so okay. if you say this one is scrub oak, it could actually be leather oak. Because uh -huh. at least these two species share that goal because they're so closely related. Um, so so that's one thing to keep in mind. But yes, I definitely think you should document both the plant and the goal. And if possible, have them both as one photo. But, you know, the photo could have the goal and maybe some leaves that would mm -hmm. give you enough information to to make people comfortable identifying it to, to species right. level even as the plant and then link these two observations together because they're really crucial for one another right okay i have one more question uh if let's say you have a tree that is full of this uh, galls does it uh, hurt the tree or does it kill the tree eventually so i think i'll, I'll take one stab at this um most of the time it does not kill the tree. At least that's the general common knowledge of land managers and, um, and stewards who observe these things. Uh, there are interesting scenarios though, where you see certain trees are more susceptible to the gall inducers. And I think there's just a lot not known as to why that's the case. And you, and you will see again, depending on, on the gall inducer, um, some, some trees will lose those leaves prematurely and it does give you an impression that it perhaps is taking away a little bit of its primary production capabilities but for the most part um it uh it seems to be a bit of a balance as charlie iceman is you know that quote i referenced earlier when he talks about it being a bit of a truce in the evolutionary arms race it's almost like the plant through this odd strategy is able to contain the damage, so to speak. Um, now that said, there are certain situations and I, I can't remember the tree, um, Ugh. an Eastern deciduous tree <laughs> that I can't think about the top of my head that can, uh, can be damaged by, uh, too many galls. And I'm sure there are other instances of that, but it seems to be uncommon. Marav, do you have anything you want to add to that? Yeah, just, so I, th I mean, I agree that in general, they don't harm the plant, even though you can find valley oaks for example with hundreds of galls on them many different species on one tree if the trees in of oh, the plant is in good shape it shouldn't be uh too much for it uh to tolerate but i i understood that if the plant is not doing well then that could be more damaging so more difficult for it to tolerate. You know, I have some um, valley oak behind me in the cage. I've been, I'm raising some caterpillars and I really had no clue what those things on the plant. So there is Wonderful. on the street, there is five mm -hmm. or six of these trees and I would just park my car and just walk around and pick the greenest and the healthiest part of the tree. And whenever I see something like that, I would just cut it off. I really had no clue what it was. And I also, I've seen many, many times willow like that with that red, red uh -huh. stuff on it. Yeah. So next time you go to cut, you know, these plants for your caterpillars, check them out and okay. look at all these amazing galls because valley oaks are just incredible and you might find different species than what we find here but i'm i'm just amazed by valley oaks i think they have beautiful amazing shapes and then willows other than that little apple like willow apple gall there are many other species as well and some of them are really interesting i noticed it looks like you have some cabinets behind you do you, do you have a collection yeah I, yeah. I do I do have it's a butterflies and moths. I raise a lot of things. So the the cages behind me, you can see there's back there, there's some cages. I have some silk moths in there, I have some butterflies in there. They are eating, busy eating. Wow. So you can so start who's... rearing some of these galls. There's a lot of galls that we need someone to try to rear to figure out <laughs> who's actually inside. So <laughs> Yeah, you might be the right person. I was gonna ask about rearing the, the galls. Does the um does the tree have to be continue to be alive to support the, um, you know, with, with butterflies that you can take the chrysalis at, when it's at that point, it doesn't have to be attached to a live 
a live yeah so that's that's a, that's the thing i think it's it depends on when you remove it so if they finished fitting and it's just like the chrysalis inside or the pupa uh-huh. inside then they'll probably be able to hatch and for many of them like michael mentioned uh they drop off from the tree as part of their natural life cycle so i mean mm. think about all these um deciduous oaks for example they drop mm-hmm. their leaves anyway in the fall so it's part of the gold cycle to drop down to the ground with the leaf and by the way if you heard about the jumping goals we didn't mention them today but those are pretty amazing so that's something i'd recommend watching there's a beautiful uh, deep look video by kqd um about the jumping goals so these goals are found on valley oaks and other closely related species and when they drop from the tree they jump and in around sacramento supposedly there are like hundreds of them at the same time you can see them jumping on the sidewalk for example uh-uh. <laughs> when they're trying to hide themselves in in the ground i guess doesn't work as well on uh, sidewalk so. yeah i think that it's a good analogy would be all the different pupation strategies that you might see in different insects there's analogous things going on with galls too a lot of times so for you know, just another angle at the rearing question. I, I've tried a few times to rear galls and there's definitely a, a methodology required because the timing is very critical uh, to, uh, if you don't exactly know when they're done, you don't know when they're mm-hmm. when they're about to, um, uh, you know, take the next step. And then especially in the springtime, some of these gall species like that Cocosynips attractans uh, is very, very, very fast process. And being off by a day or two is probably all it takes to fail in trying to rear it. So um, take some take some practice. It takes some luck. And uh, it, I think that the best guide that people tend to point to is one that again I keep mentioning Charlie Iceman, but on his blog he has a guide to rearing leaf miners actually, and the same principles pretty much apply to galls. So. Uh, I can I can find that link and share it. So what what time of the year, like fall, is the best time to to go now tomorrow morning? Now, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> now no, seriously, now, now last week the fall. Yeah, I was traveling. So when I came back a couple of weeks ago, I went out and I was so happy to see <laughs> the fall generation because those are the pretty ones. Okay. The ones in the spring are all kind of green, tiny, not very exciting, kind of look alike. But in the fall, you see all the, you know, crazy weird pink stars, oh, uh, you know, strawberries, like the thing on Michael's background. You know, all these beautiful things, those are now. I mean, there's some colorful ones in the spring, but m- most of the colors come out now. And they stay there longer because, again, in the spring, you would miss many of them because there are lots of golds on catkins of oaks, for example. Not a lot, but there's some species that use the catkins. So those drop down and disappear at some point. Um, so we, if you're not there on time, you will miss them. Uh, but they are pretty brilliant as well. I like that. The, the thing that got me interested in galls is I'm, I'm a native plant enthusiast and I hike and I'm always looking at plants. So I, over the last past year, I really started looking at this gall thing and I found a number of different galls and I find that really fascinating because I like the plants and that's like part of the plant. Uh, that yeah that's really fun and if you know the plants it's even easier because yeah. then you know you could look at the list sometimes what i do is i actually open the book and i look for a plant that i haven't you know found goals on before and i'll go and look for that plant and often you you know you and when you see the photo you know what to look for because right. um, it's it's sorted by plants uh by the host so you know i could go and look for chemise and look at the photo and then it's like, oh, okay, that's what I'm looking for. If I didn't see the photo, I'd never know what to look for because it's very, very tiny. I mean, think about chemise yeah. leaves. Uh, but then, yeah, I opened the book, I look at the photo and I found it for the first time. And now I've learned a new species. So next time I go out, I, I look for chemise. 
and oh, then yeah. you know it's it's a difficult one but anyway in general and and sometimes it's it's a fun exercise to look at a plant that you've never seen before you know nothing about and you see some weird structures and just like michael demonstrated is it a goal is it not a goal it's a really fun exercise to do do the um, wasps or the other insects that create the gall, do they provide any benefit either to the plant or how how else do they provide a benefit within the in, in, environment um, aside from just reproducing? The, my default answer is it's part of the broader food web and part uh -huh. of the broader web of biodiversity that supports so many different things. So Marav talked about inquilins and parasites and predators uh, all so connecting to these galls. Uh -huh. um, I, uh, and then of course the ants can be supported uh -huh. by the galls as well. Um, I don't know of any, anything where like, for example, dispersal is aided by galls no, or, you know, anything so. like that, but, um, but yeah, that's that's sort of my default. It's part of this, you know, foundational stitching of the food web. Uh -huh. When I'm out on bio blitzes, by the way, I love to find galls and show them to people because I find that, you know, people's insect knowledge is generally pretty pretty low, and mm -hmm. despite that, they usually know about monarchs and milkweeds. Usually, not always. Um, and I can say, hey, you know about how monarch caterpillars require milkweeds, like. A lot of people think that's a unique thing. Being a specialist uh -huh. is unique. That's how they've learned it. And when you can start to open their eyes and show these examples of all these specialist relationships that exist and, and point out that like by some estimates, 90% of insects uh, are specialists. Um, you know, it depends on where you're at, of course, but that's one, one common estimate that I see. It helps them understand the importance of biodiversity at that point. So that's another way that I use galls, like out on walks, for example. And I wanted to add to your question that it's sometimes interesting to see how much they actually interact with other species. So one gall species, and again, we don't know much about them, right? Mm -hmm. Even those uh, valley oak apples, so the big apples that I showed you before, the California gall wasp. Um, so there's one species that induces those apples, right? This is the one that makes them happen. Uh, but then there are up to 15 different species of insects that would use it afterwards. Mm -hmm. So some of them are inquilins, some of them are parasites. But you could find earwigs that would use that. The, the original inducer would finish its cycle and leave at some point, and you know, you'll see the exit holes. But if you look at old uh, apples like that, or galls, then you often see different sizes of exit holes, which means that different organisms Exit, there is right? no sound coming through these. Oops. No um, sound coming through there. Uh, I'll put them on mute. Thank you. Uh, Ivan, I'm putting you on mute. Okay. Go ahead. Um, yeah, so up to 15 different species can use these apples because they will stay on the tree often for a few years. And maybe uh -huh. even after they drop to the ground, it's still a pretty good habitat for different things. Um, so, yeah. And that's incredible. That's just one species. That's great. Anyone else? This was absolutely fascinating. I, I loved it. And I'm sure everyone else here loved it too. Um, I learned so much. So I want to Thank you very much. Um, oh, I see what I'm going to do here. Uh, and there we are. Everybody's there now. So if anybody wants to ask any other questions. So Kim, should we just send you the the links to those resources, like the Gall Week project and um, and the books and so forth, so you can share them? Or what's the best? Next step that, that. that would be great if you could, um, you have Blaine's uh, uh, thing. So it's really to him, he communicates with the group, okay. but but certainly copy me because I will use them for my own benefit to add them to my own group. Uh, but uh, he, he will then send it out to everyone. And I, I will also send him the link 
for the recording. And this is recorded, so the um, recording will be out there, certainly until we have our next speaker, and maybe beyond that, depending on the um, generosity of Zoom to my personal account, that uh, how long they'll store videos out there for me. Sounds, sounds good. Thank you for the support and thanks for the opportunity to talk about Gauls. I'm happy to answer questions offline too, via email or, or whatever. And I'm sure Marav is as well. So yes. um, check out those oak leaves. 